Okay, we have started. Do you have any question before I proceed with discussing the pool? No, Doctor, all clear. Okay. So I left the discussion of at a Jew to that child. Auschwitz Belsen, I began to talk like a Jew. I think I may be a Jew. Okay? So I will go back to this stanza and to the one that precedes it. It's stuck in a barbed wire snare. Itch, itch, itch. Itch, I could hardly speak. I thought every German was you. So she is referring to the German language. So even the German language is abhorred by the lady. So she associates everything related to Germany and to Nazism with oppression and suffering. So the lady couldn't speak the German language because she abhors this language. It is a symbol of persecution for her. So she associates the persecution of women by men with the persecution of the Jews and the gypsies by the Nazis. So Nazism for her in this poem is a symbol of persecution. So it's stuck in a barbed wire snare Itch, 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 I could hardly speak. I thought every German was you. Okay? So I told you last time that Hitler considered the German race superior to all other races. So that's why he thought that he had the right to control the universe. Now, the speaker or Sylvia Plath in this poem uses the German as a symbol of oppression. So that's why she says, I thought every German was you. So she associates her father with the patriarchal figure who considers himself superior to the female figure. And the language obscene, an engine, an engine chuffing me off like a Jew. So therefore she compares herself to a Jew and the male figure of her society to a Nazi. So in other words, she wants to say that the female figure is persecuted by the male figure, just as the Jews were persecuted by Hitler during World War I. Okay? So the Jew here is a symbol uh, of the creature who is hated, abhorred, demeaned, and looked down. A Jew to that Chau, Auschwitz, Belsen, and these are names of concentration camps. Okay, so the concentration camps are camps where uh, the Nazis persecuted the Jews. So she sees herself as a person persecuted in a concentration camp. 
I began to talk like a Jew. I think I may well be a Jew. So this is how Sylvia Plath uses concrete images to express her ideas and her feelings. Okay, so she doesn't use abstract images or abstractions to express her ideas and feelings. And the poem is a highly imagist. Okay, so that German language is used as a symbol of per persecution. The Nazi figure is a symbol of the patriarchal figure that persecutes the woman. The Jew who is or who was despised by the Nazis is a symbol of the woman who is persecuted and despised by the patriarchal figure of her society. So all of these are concrete images. The snows of Tyrol, the clear beer of Vienna, are not very pure or true. With my gypsy ancestress, and my weird luck, and my tarot pack, and my tarot pack, I may be a bit of a Jew. Again, she associates herself with gypsies who were looked down by the Nazis. Now, the tarot pack, it is also called the tarot pack. Tarot, T-A-R-O-T. The tarot pack of cards. Okay, now according to Phoenician myth, the term is taken from Phoenician myth. Phoenician, Phoenician. According to Phoenician myth, okay, I will spell it for you. Phoenician, P H O. E N I C I A N, myth M Y T H. Now, according to Phoenician myth, the tarot pack of cards was used to foretell the times of the rise of the Nile, the Nile River. In other words, it was used to foretell the times. Of fertility and here we mean natural fertility so when the Nile rises it means that there will be a lot of water and there will be fertility at the natural level okay now Sylvia Plath associates herself with gypsies who use the tarot pack of cards to foretell the future Okay, now she associates herself with the gypsies because she considers herself inferior to the male figure of her society. Okay, so that's why she says, and with my gypsy ancestress, i.e. maybe her great-great-grandmother is a gypsy woman, and my weird luck and my tarot back, and my tarot back, I might be a bit of a Jew. So she associates herself with the Jews and the gypsies that are considered inferior to the Nazi figure. I have always been scared of you. With your loft vavi, your gobbledygook, and your neat mustache, and your Aryan eye, bright blue, Panzer man, Panzer man, oh, you. Okay, so here she is saying that she has always been scared of her father. With his loft vavi. Okay, so these are German military terms and according to the footnote 
Luftwaffe is the German Air Force. And Panzerman refers to the Nazi tank Corps in World War II. Okay, so I have always been scared of you with your loft bathy, your gobbledygook, and your neat mustache, and your Aryan eye, bright blue. So, number one, she associates her father with the Nazis through using military terms associated with the German military forces during World War II. This is number one. Number two, she associates her father with the Aryan race, i.e. with the Germanic race that considers the Germans superior to other races. Okay? Now, the Aryans have bright blue eyes. Yes, they are Europeans. And the majority of the Europeans have fair skin, blonde hair, and blue eyes. And you need mustache. So the mustache stands for the power of the male figure. Okay? So Sylvia Pass is saying that she has always been scared of the male figure of her society who treats women with force and brutality. So the male figure, according to her, is a brute that inflicts pain on women. Not God, but a swastika so black no sky could squeak through. Now the swastika is the symbol that stands for Nazism. It is the symbol that stands for Nazism. So she says, Panzer man, Panzer man, oh you, not God, but a swastika so black, no sky could squeak through. So she compares the male figure of her society not only to the God, because Last time I said that she says he is a god or a bag full of god. And I commented on the idea of the god saying that the god is a source of giving orders, rules, regulations to man. So according to her, the male figure dictates the rules and the principles that the woman should behave or according to which the woman should behave. Now here she's saying that you are not a god, you are a swastika. So black, no sky could squeak through. So the male figure of her society is a powerful figure that cannot be shaken, that cannot be destroyed. Every woman adores a fascist. The boot in the face, the brute, brute heart of a brute like you. I think this is ironic. Taking the whole poem into consideration, I realize that 
what she's saying here is ironic. She says every woman adores a fascist. And we know that fascism is associated uh, with Hitler, with Mussolini. Mussolini, M-U-S-S-O-L-I-N-Y. As we know, Mussolini is one of the dictators or is one of the European dictators that ruled Italy during World War II. And he is one of the allies of Hitler, yes. Uh, not maybe she's here criticizing the woman for not uh, revoluting against the man. Maybe, yes. What is this noise? Stop this first, please. Okay. What's your name? The one who's causing noise. Okay. Every woman adores a fascist, the boot in the face, the brute, brute, heart of a brute like you. You stand at the blackboard. Daddy, in the picture I have of you, a cleft in your chin instead of your foot, but no less a devil for that, no not, and less the black man who bit my pretty red heart in two. Okay, now here she is referring to her father as a teacher. Okay, so she says you stand at the blackboard in the picture I have you, I have of you, a cleft in your chin instead of your foot, but no less a devil for that, no not, and less the black man who bit my heart into. Okay, so her father is a black man that has caused her suffering. He has destroyed her emotionally. So that's why she says you have bit my pretty red heart in two. I was ten when they buried you. So he died when she was ten years old. At 20, I tried to die and get back, back, back to you. I thought even the bones would do. Okay? So at the age of 20, she wanted to commit suicide so that she would be with her father. So she wants to avenge herself on her father 
hell by revenging herself on his bones. Okay, so she rebels at the very beginning against her society by committing suicide. Okay, so this is the first step that she has taken. So she cannot survive in this patriarchal society as a result. She tries to kill herself. She tries to commit suicide. But they pulled me out of the sack and they stuck me together with glue. And then I knew what to do. So she was saved. She committed suicide, but she was brought back to life. Now she wants to liberate herself from this patriarchal society. Okay, so the first attempt failed. She tried to kill herself. Now she is going to revenge, to avenge herself through another means. Okay, the lady in Perda raises her voice. She rebels ferociously against her husband, i.e. against the patriarchal figure of her society. In this poem, the lady rebels against her society. She, d she destroys the patriarchal authority of her society in a certain way. So this poem, like the Perda poem, is divided into two main parts. The first part presents the position of women in a patriarchal society. In the second part, the poem shows us how women should liberate themselves from the constraints of their patriarchal society. The lady says, and then I knew what to do. I made a model of you, a man in black with a mind camp look and a love of the rack and the screw. Okay, now to avenge herself on her father, she has created an effigy of her father. Effigy, E double F. I G Y. What does effigy mean? An effigy is an object that symbolizes her father. Okay, now the idea of creating an effigy symbolizing her father is borrowed, is taken from Phoenician myth. Okay, now according to Phoenician myth, the Phoenicians used to commemorate the death and the resurrection of their fertility god, Adonis, through making an effigy and throwing it into the sea. The waves pushed the effigy northward, towards Biblos, the place where Adonis was killed by a boar, boar, B-O-A-R. 
So when the FG ended up at B plus, the Phoenicians associated it with the rebirth of Adonis, i.e. with natural rebirth, natural fertility. Now the lady uses the FG as a symbol of showing how she has liberated herself from her society. Okay, so the lady has created a model of her father. But the model looks like a Nazi. That's why she says a man in black with Mein Kampf look. Mein Kampf is a German term. And this is, in fact, the title of Hitler's autobiography. Hitler's autobiography is entitled My Struggle or My Strife. It depends on the translation. Okay, so the lady made a model of her daddy, a man in black with a mind camp look. So she made an effigy of her father as a Nazi who is fond of persecuting others. She says, a man in black with a mind camp look and a love of the rack and the screw. The screw and the rack are two instruments of persecuting others. Okay, so she has made an effigy of her father or a model of her father. This model looks like a Nazi who is fond of persecuting others, i.e. she has presented him as a man who is fond of persecuting women. And I said, I do, I do. So, Daddy, I am finally through. I, I am finally done with you. I am finally done with the patriarchal authority of, her, of my society. The black telephones off at the root. The voices just can't worm through. Here we have a reference to the Gestapo, G-E-S-T-A-P-O. The Gestapo is the intelligence bureau that was created by Hitler. Intelligence bureau, like the FBI, in other words. The black telephones off at the root. The voices just can't worm through, i.e. she has destroyed the authority of the male figure. Okay? So here it is similar to cutting off the telephone, which is symbolic of the intelligence that Hitler got through the Gestapo. Okay, so the Gestapo was a system created by Hitler to make sure his rule would not be or should not be shaken. Okay? And the same applies to the patriarchal society uh, authority of the male figure. Okay? So by cutting off the black telephone at the root, 
the lady destroys the authority of the male figure over the female figure. If I've killed one man, I've killed two. The vampire who said he was you and drank my blood for a year, seven years if you want to know. Daddy, you can lie back. Now, so by killing, by symbolically killing her father, she kills two men, i.e. she kills her father, and she destroys the patriarchal authority of the male figure. And she liberates herself also from her husband. Her husband is referred to as the vampire who said he was you and drank my blood for a year, seven years if you want to know. So both her father and her husband stand for the male authority that persecutes women in her society. By the way, Sylvia Plath was married to the British poet that use that use I will spell it for you that is the first name T E D the family name of her husband is use it is spelled H U G H E S that use and that use is one of the major English poets of the second half of the 20th century, and I think he is still alive. He was the poet laureate poet laureate, laureate L-A-U-R-E-A-T-E poet laureate, شاعر البلاط الإنجليزي Okay, so she was married to Ted Hughes, they separated, and she ended her life when she committed suicide in 1963. Okay, so if I've killed one man, I've killed two. The vampire who said, he was you and drank my blood for a year seven years if you want to know daddy you can lie back now there is a stake in your fat black heart and the villagers never like you. So this is how she kills her father. She creates, she makes a model of her father and stabs the model in the heart. There is a stake in your fat black heart and the villagers never liked you. They are dancing and stamping on you. They always knew it was you. Daddy, daddy, you bastard, I'm so. Okay, so she has destroyed the patriarchal authority by stabbing the effigy of her father in the heart. So by killing the symbol of her father, she destroys the patriarchal authority of her society. So she says, 
and the villagers never liked you. They are dancing and stamping on you. Okay, so the villagers are dancing and stamping on him. So they are celebrating the destruction of the male authority. They always knew it was you. Daddy, daddy. You bastard. I'm through. I.e. I am already done with you. Okay, do you have any questions? Doctor? Yes. Uh, is there some contradictions in the poem? And she wanted to commit suicide in order to meet her father. And uh, she is also criticizing him. Although she was just 10, yani she doesn't know exactly his character. Can you repeat what you said? I mean, is there some contradictions in the poem? One time no. she said that... Okay, the answer is no. Go on. Uh, because she said she wants to be united with her father, so she committed suicide. Plus, she doesn't... That, uh, even the bulls, let me say one thing. Even the bulls would do i.e. she wants to take to avenge herself on her father's bones okay so so she she couldn't kill him in reality so she would kill him in the two this is number one number two i said she wants to die because she cannot face a patriarchal society so as a result she wants to liberate herself by committing suicide Okay, so her first attempt at killing herself failed because she was rescued. Later on, she killed her father metaphorically, symbolically. Is it clear? But she committed suicide uh, again after she says that she, she has uh, freed her, herself from the patriarchal society. Okay, we don't care about whether she committed suicide later on or not. In the poem, the lady proposes a project of liberating women from their patriarchal society. How? She suggests that the patriarchal authority should be destroyed. Okay. Hey, doctor. We don't care about whether she committed suicide a year later or not. In the poem, we have a certain condition of women in the patriarchal society, and the woman as a feminist figure proposes a solution to her crisis, i.e. to the crisis of living in a male-dominated society. So the lady suggests that women should destroy this patriarchal society if they want to have their identities as real human beings. Okay, so she is proposing a solution. Okay, so by killing, by stabbing her father's effigy in the heart, she achieves metaphorically, symbolically, liberation. She achieves the liberation of the female figure.
Okay? So we don't have to say that the lady has failed because she committed suicide in 1963. I don't care about her life. I have a poem. And I'm analyzing the poem as a poem, as it is. Okay? So in the poem, the woman liberates herself from the patriarchal society by ignoring the dictates of the male figure. How does she ignore the dictates of the male figure? It is described through the effigy that she destroys at the end of the poem. Is it clear? Clear, doctor. Okay. Yes, doctor. The poem was written in 1962. Sylvia Plath died in 1963, i.e. one year later. And I think Sylvia Plath was a deranged woman. That's why she committed suicide at the end. This means that she was mentally, psychologically disturbed. This is the name of deranged. Virginia Woolf, her predecessor, also committed suicide by drowning in a river. I don't think these women were mentally or psychologically normal. Even Hilda Doolittle. who was also a feminist figure, was psychologically troubled. That's why she met Hitler. And she was psycho... Uh, not Hitler. She met Sigmund Freud, and she was psychoanalyzed by him. Sorry, doctor. Yes. So do you think in that time all women were insane? That's what yeah. you are trying to say? They were what? They were insane? Yes. I do. I'm not going to say yes. I'm sure Sylvia Plath was neurotic towards the end of her life. Maybe she was neurotic as a result of her husband's treatment of her. Anyway, by destroying, metaphorically, the, fee, the male figure, the woman, achieves liberation. So this is what she wants to, uh, to say. Even in a uh, season of migration to the north, which you may have read before, I think, and I'm sure those who are repeating the course, read and studied season of migration to the north in one of their courses. Husna bint Mahmoud in the poem kills her husband. She doesn't want to get married to 
Wad Rais, who is an old man. And she doesn't want to get married after her husband, Mustafa Saeed, died. So by killing Wad Rais, she symbolically destroys the main authority of her Sudanese society. Hassan Kalafani in his novel, Ma Tabaqqa Lakum, presents also a Palestinian woman who uh, stabs her husband in the groins. She kills him. And by stabbing him in the groins, and I'm not going to give you the meaning of groins, look it up. Groin, G-R-O-I-N-I-N-S. By stabbing her husband in the groins, she destroys that traitor because she has been married to a man who works for the Israelis. So at the end of the novel, she destroys to kill the Palestinian enemy of the Palestinian nation. Okay, so she stabs him in that particular place to show that Palestine doesn't need to have any more traitors. And Palestine doesn't want to have women who give birth to traitors. Khalid Husseini, the American novelist of an Afghan origin also uses the same idea. The female figure kills her husband who has been persecuting and oppressing her. And by killing him, Khalid Husseini destroys the patriarchal authority of the Afghan society. He liberates women through this liberation process or project. So Khalid Husseini and Ghassan Kadafani and Tayyip Saleh may have read Sylvia Plath's death, who knows? Is it clear? Yes. Dear Doctor. Okay, so this is the end of yeah, next time I will discuss, or we will discuss, we together will discuss Marian Moore's In Distrust of Barrett's Okay? I will send you a copy of the poem by WhatsApp. And if you want to download it, I think it is available uh, online. Now, who is Miriam Moore? Miriam Moore is a modern American poetess. She was a friend of Ezra Pound, whom I mentioned last time. Miriam Moore is one of the modernist poets who did away with the past. She is one of the modernist poets who did away with the past. What does it mean? Now, modern poets or writers in general are divided into two groups. The first group wants to come up with new techniques, with new ways of writing without 
leaving the literature of the past behind them. I mean, they didn't want to isolate, to separate themselves from the literature of the past, i.e. the poems, the novels, the plays that were written before them. Okay? So these poets wanted to deal with the past, i.e. to deal with past experiences, using new techniques. Okay, so of these poets, we have Israel Pound, we have T.S. Eliot, we have James Joyce. So all of these writers took the experiences of the past and presented them in new ways. The second group of modernist poets said, no, we will break completely with the past. We will deal with new experiences using new techniques and ways of writing. Okay, now, the American poets in particular, or the American writers in particular, wanted to break completely with the European past. I mean, they didn't want to deal with uh, with English experiences. They wanted to say that they were American. They wanted to say that they belong to a completely different country, different society, and different culture. So that's why this group of American poets wanted to deal with the American experience. Okay? Now, the second group of modern sports dealt with new experiences and came up with new techniques of writing. Now, Miriam Moore is one of the poets who broke completely with the past. Okay, now in this poem, In Distrust of Merits, Miriam Moore seems to be dealing with war. So this is the literal meaning of the poem. Okay? So there is war everywhere. People are killing each other. But the poem can be analyzed from Freud's theory of psychoanalysis. So this is your approach. The approach or the methodology for analyzing this poem is Freud's theory of psychoanalysis. Here I'm not going to refer to the conscious and to the unconscious. In other words, I'm going to refer to Hitler's view of civilization. Uh, to Freud's view of civilization. And I referred to this in the Shakespeare course before. Okay. Freud wrote a book entitled Civilization and Its Discontents. Discontents, D I S C O N. T E N T S, and you have to underline the title because this is the title of the book. In this book, Freud deals with how civilization requires that man control his drives and tendencies. Okay, so living in a civilized universe requires that man controls his psychological needs and tendencies and drives. Okay, and I referred to this before. I said in the Shakespeare course, anger, violence are tendencies
that man share with animals. And if man's life is controlled by anger and violence, he will behave as an animal. And that's why I associated Macbeth with the soul, with the state of nature. I said Macbeth as a ruler uh, rules by force and by cunning as if he were living in a jungle. So he is controlled by a sense of violence, a sense of hatred, right? Now, according to Freud, to live in a civilized universe, man has to control the drives that lead him to behave as an animal. And in this book, Freud deals with two important instincts. Life instinct. which he calls Eros and Death Instinct. Eros is spelled E-R-O-S. Okay? Now Freud believes that a civilized man should be controlled by Eros i.e. he should be controlled by his life instinct. If man is controlled by his death instinct, he will lead to his own destruction as well as to the destruction of human life on earth. So this is the approach to analyzing the poem. Now in the poem, many more deals with the death instinct and the, the life instinct. And at the end of the poem, she comes to the conclusion that if man's life is controlled by patience, 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 which is one of the seven Christian values. So if man's life is controlled by patience, man will not be urged to commit crimes or to kill others. So in this case, Maya Moore is a proponent of life instinct and she is against the death instinct. So those who wage wars are those who valorize death instinct over life instinct. And she says at the end of the poem, the real war that should be waged is a war that purges man of his evil nature. Yes, clear. Yes, doctor. Yes. Okay. okay, so try to download the poem if you can, or anyway, I will send it to you by WhatsApp. Uh, this is enough for the poems that we have to analyze. Now I will refer to something related to how to write a research paper. Okay. Now, at the end of the chapter that deals with writing a research paper, you have a sample research paper. I'm not going to read it because it takes a long time, so I'm not going to waste a whole lecture on reading this uh, sample research paper online. It is your duty to read it. Okay, so read this research paper during the weekend and look at how the writer of this research paper introduces his quotes and how he documents his quotes 
within parentheses. This is number one. Number two, you have also to see or to realize how the writer incorporates, i.e. how he works his quotes into his or her research paper. So the research paper that you have at the end of this chapter is documented according to the MLA style sheet. Okay? Now, the two groups of students may read this research paper. It is fine. It teaches you how to introduce your quotes, how to work them into your research paper, how to comment on them, how to analyze them. And now the documentation differs a little bit. Now, the APA students have another sample in the book. So at the end of this chapter, you will have handouts taken from another source. And the handouts are entitled APA documenting, APA parenthetical citation, and what have you. At the end of these sheets, you have many research papers written according to the APA style sheet. So I will suggest one for you. Okay. Directly at the end of the APA parenthetical citation, you have a research paper entitled Autobiography, Feminism, and the Practice of Action Research. This research paper is written according to the APA style sheet. So the language students should read this research paper. And the literature students should read the one that they have at the end of the chapter that is entitled Writing the Research Paper. Is it clear? Yes, doctor. Okay, so next time I will start discussing how to write a list of words cited or a list of references and in this case I will start with how to write a bibliography note for a book written by one author. For example, you have let's say Othello. Othello is a play written by one author. The author is William Shakespeare. Okay, so if you want to write a bibliography note for Othello, you can do the following. You start with the family name of the author. So you start with Shakespeare. Comma, and the family name of the author should be written next to the margin. You don't have to skip any space. The family name of the author should be written next to the margin, next to the red line that you have. You don't have to skip any space. So you write Shakespeare, comma, and I, uh, I will do it according to the MLA style sheet first. Then you write William, period, O Sal, this is the title of the book. You capitalize O and you underline O Sal because it is the title of a book, period. After O Sal, you have to write the name of the city or the name of the place of the publication of the text. Let us say it is London. London is the place of the publication of Othello. 
After London, you add a colon. Colon. After the colon, you write the name of the publisher. So the publisher of Othalo is, let's say, Longman. And after the name of the publisher, you write the date of the publication of the book. So you add a comma and the date of the publication of the book. Let's say 1982. Period. This is how you do it according to the MLA style sheet. Now, according to the APA style sheet, you have slight differences. You start with the family name of the author. So you write Shakespeare. Comma, and the initial of William. So you write W only. You don't have to write William. W. Period. Then within parentheses, you write the date of the publication of the book. 1982. Period. Then you write the title. Ostalo. It should be underlined. After Othello, you write London, the place of the publication of the book. Colin. Then you write Longman. Then comma. Then period. No comma. Because you mentioned the date of the publication of after Shakespeare's name. Okay? So this is how you write a bibliography note for a book by one author. Did you write it down? Yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. Doctor, can you please repeat it just for... Uh, repeat what? To make sure that the bibliography note. I will send it to you by WhatsApp. Wait okay, a uh, one more question. Uh, what is required to read for uh, MLA students? For what? For MLA students, what research paper you said? I said the research paper that you have at the end of the chapter that is entitled Writing the Research Paper. Okay, and I sent you the sample by WhatsApp. So if your bibliography note runs into, let's say, two lines, as you have in the sample that I have just sent you, the first line should not be indented, i.e. you shouldn't skip a space at the beginning of the first line. But at the beginning of the second line, you have to skip Five spaces, i.e. five clicks. Okay, did you get it? That if your bibliography note runs into more than one line, the first line is usually unindented, i.e. you don't have to skip a space at the beginning of the first line. But at the beginnings of the following or the subsequent lines, you have to skip five spaces. And I sent you the two samples by WhatsApp. Check it, if you please. Do you have any questions? Clear, doctor. Okay, I will discuss. This is the class now, since you have no more questions. Okay, that's thank, thank you. you so much. Okay, that's thank you. So thank much. you. Okay.